This evening, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our keynote speaker for uh, this evening, uh, Robert P. Morgenthau. As you can see, he's going to be giving a, a talk, which is called Spreading the Word from the American Committee for Syrian and Armenian Relief to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a Memorial to the Holocaust. In 1915, the American Committee for Syrian and Armenian Relief, later renamed Near East Relief in 1919, was established by a group of well-to-do Americans, including Henry Morgenthau. Its mission was to raise awareness of the massive humanitarian crisis taking place in the Ottoman Empire and bringing much needed support to its victims. An unintended consequence was inspiring four generations and counting of Morgenthau's to serve the survivors of genocide and remember the victims. Robert P. Morgenthau is the great-grandson of Henry Morgenthau Sr., former U.S. Ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. Bob Morgenthau is the treasurer of the Board of Trustees of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. He is formerly a partner of Lazard Frere and Company and founder of North Road Capital Management, and he's currently a principal of Spears Abacus Advisors, where he has been working since 2011 and is a senior member of the investment team. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Robert Morgenthau. Robert. Thank you, Barlow. Um, appreciate that very much. And it's just, it's just great to be here. And, and special thanks to Tim uh, Langill and the team for putting all this together. And of course, to Father Z for the initial invitation to, uh, to bring me here. And I, I appreciate it very, very much. Um, it's, it's, it's just such an honor to be part of this important event. Um, I've prepared a few words. Don't worry, the type is big. I'll have you out of here. We'll, we'll have you out of here by midnight. Um, uh, it, it's it's just so inspiring to be part of a group um, that is as talented. The the sessions earlier today um, and that go on during this week are are really extraordinary, um, and it's with the most noble of intent, of course, because it's to help past victims um, and to chip away at the possibility of future atrocities. Um, sadly, the need for that work continues on today, and, and we've heard about um, genocide that's happening um, today in, in Burma. Um, it's, it's really extraordinary um, to think that these things are still happening. So it was, it was just an incredible honor. Um, when I looked at previous year's programs, um, I couldn't help but think that, um, well, I don't stand up to the, to the other academicians, but, but I think I do have a story to tell. I, I'm a descendant not an expert, um, and I'm certainly not an academician. So my plan is to spend the next hour or so, maybe less, um, depending on how quickly I, I gear up to speak, um, telling you about four generations of my family. In a small way, that amounts to a, a longitudinal study of public service in the United States. My overall theme is communication, because this is Genocide Awareness Week, um, and um, I wanted to talk about making people aware of, of genocide um, and spreading the word for the purpose of rescue or relief or remembrance, or, or all three, as is often the case. Sub-themes will crop up, um, especially um, as I talk about my great-grandfather, Henry Morgenthau, um, who, um, uh, Henry, we, we, I will call him senior. There are two Henrys in this story, and, and I will try to keep them straight as best I possibly can. But um, he was an ambassador, as Barlow said, the, to the Ottoman Empire. Um, and I will also talk about Henry Morgenthau Jr.'s time in the Roosevelt administration. Both tried to make sense out of working with the Department of State, which was not easy to do. Um, so let's see, which direction do we go? Well, we have an inactive clip flicker, clicker, so here we go. So um, naturally, I've heard family stories my entire life. Um, I never met my great-grandfather, but I knew how much he shaped my father's life. I did know my grandfather, but, but frankly, only barely. I was 10 years old when he died. He was in poor health. He seemed gruff and extremely formal. It wasn't until 2015 that I truly became interested in their stories. I joined a group of cousins on a journey to Yerevan, Armenia, for the 100th anniversary of the commemoration of the genocide. This fine trio greeted us when we toured the Henry Morgenthau Primary School in Yerevan. The young man in the middle 
summoned enough English and courage to announce that he was Henry Morgenthau and that he wanted to officially welcome us to his school. I have no idea, I had no idea how moving an experience it would be to spend the week in Yerevan and to meet people like this who, who just absolutely rolled out the red carpet for us um, as descendants of, of somebody who would helped the community a hundred years before. Um, it turned out that I had to go halfway around the world to discover a deeper interest in my own family. Um, my references are the writings of both Henry Morgenthau, both Henry Morgenthau's, and the storytelling of my father, Robert. Um, I'm also indebted to uh, Rebecca Erbelding's terrific book, Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe. Dr. Erbelding spent years digging through the papers of the Library of Congress, National Archive, and Roosevelt Library. What started as a doctoral thesis finished as a thorough and original analysis of the creation of the War Refugee Board. It's a fantastic read, too, and I would recommend it to anybody. Uh, what started as a doctoral thesis turned out to be a, a page turner. Um, my family, my family's been lucky. Among my ancestors, there are neither victims nor survivors of genocide. I would say we've been more genocide adjacent, which is a much more comfortable place to be. More than just observers, to be sure, I guess, at least in the case of my grandfather and great-grandfather. Their story, collectively, I guess, begins in 1865 when Lazarus Morgenthau moved his family from Mannheim, Germany to Brooklyn. Lazarus was a rags to riches to rags story. He lost almost everything to the U.S. embargo of imported goods during the Civil War. He had 13 children. My great-grandfather Henry was 10 years old when they moved to the United States. Henry was exceptionally bright. Though he spoke no English when he arrived, he cruised through high school, got into city college, but was forced to withdraw by the erratic behavior of his father. His father, undiagnosed, obviously, because it was a long time ago, was probably bipolar and, and, and quite erratic, which thrust Henry into the role of family protector. You're getting me a new clicker. Look at that. The tech department here is very good. Thank you. Um, he never finished um, college, but somehow managed to get enrolled in Columbia Law School. So after graduation, he formed a firm with two other lawyers in their early 20s, um, doing the drudge work that older lawyers wouldn't touch. They built a strong practice handling the mind-numbing paperwork of real estate closings. So it was kind of natural that before long, Henry began to invest directly in real estate. He knew, he knew how to do it um, uh, as well as anybody. And at the time, New York City, so this was, this was late 19th century, and New York City is growing very rapidly. It's growing in two dimensions. It's growing north, of course, from its original um, uh, settling in the southern tip of Manhattan. It's growing north towards Harlem and beyond. Um, but it's also growing vertically with the new technology to build skyscrapers. And land was still relatively cheap. So um, Henry had the foresight to buy land around the expanding uh, commuter train lines, so the subway and other commuter train lines. And he, he figured out where the stations were going to be, and he bought up land around the stations. It was a pretty good strategy, and by the early part of the 20th century, um, he was wealthy enough to stop work and to focus on uh, fundraising for both not-for-profit organizations and for politicians. In that time, he becomes close to Rabbi Stephen Wise, who was a charismatic leader of the German Jewish community in New York. And Henry Helps Wise found his dream project, the fund, the, which was called the Free Synagogue. It was meant to be an alternative to, or some would say an actual rebuke of, the very hi hierarchical and expensive Temple Emmanuel on Fifth Avenue. The Free Synagogue, Henry used to like to say at recruiting and fundraising events, is to be free and democratic in its organization. It is to be pewless and dueless. He was a it was a tremendous success. In four years, the congregation swelled, and they had a, a fourth anniversary party at a fancy hotel and invited as a guest speaker Governor Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was fairly recently elected to the New Jersey uh, governorship and was viewed as perhaps the savior of the Democratic Party. But additionally, it was just that event was just about a month after the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire. 
in the audience was very receptive to Wilson's progressive ideas. Their view was that he was probably more pragmatic and electable than William Jennings Bryant, who had, Bryan, who had lost the presidential race three times in a row, clearly not electable on a national scale. Um, and Wilson seemed that he was in tune with the swelling ranks of, of working class European immigrants. Sensing that Wilson could end the 13 year drought at the president's office, Henry jumped on the bandwagon. Through Wilson, he meets um, Cleveland Dodge. Uh, a, Wilson and Dodge were classmates at Princeton. Dodge's wealth derived from copper mining. The company still bears his name, Phelps Dodge, um, a global copper mining powerhouse. He also, in addition to making money, he had many philanthropic interests. He was just as good at giving it away as he was at making it. Um, he included the YMCA, American Red Cross, New York Museum of Natural History, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the New York Public Library, all the sort of major cultural institutions of New York. But even more importantly to this story, Dodge was a supporter of the American University of Beirut and Robert College in Constantinople, whose board he actually chaired from 1909 to 1926. So Henry was an active campaigner, fundraiser, and donor. Democratic operatives gave him the nickname Uncle Henry, as in the rich uncle who was always there with a check when times got tight. During the campaign, Henry also worked closely with a guy named Charlie Crane, Charles Crane, who was an heir to the Chicago uh, Plumbing Supply Company. We still see their uh, uh, plumbing in, in bathrooms all over the country. Wilson barely squeaked through the Democratic primary. But he did win the general election, and Henry expected a cabinet position. While he was not so naive as to ignore the handicap of being Jewish, he did think that Teddy Roosevelt had removed that barrier by appointing Oscar Strauss as Secretary of Commerce. But it was not to be. Rather than a cabinet post, Henry was offered the ambassadorship to the Ottoman Empire, the so-called Jewish position, because of the proximity to Palestine. This, he felt, was a snub, so he turned it down. But after much lobbying by Wilson, Rabbi Wise, and others, Henry did take the job, and it would change his life forever. Um, Henry set out for Constantinople, but his wife Josie, pictured here on the right with uh, Reb, uh, Sister Sir Jeanne of, uh, of uh, a French convent in Constantinople, Josie stayed home for the time being. She was unenthusiastic about the prospect of the life of an ambassador's wife, and particularly un unenthusiastic about Turkey. Josie's absence, however, provided an unanticipated advantage. Henry knows that his fellow diplomats will view him as an amateur, a businessman out for an adventure. So while waiting for his wife to arrive, he does his homework. He is absolved of the obligation to entertain local officials and foreign ambassadors. He stays within the embassy, I'm going to get the direction right eventually, probably by the time I get to the last slide. Um, he stays within the embassy and does that homework. He uses the time alone to learn everything he can about the economics and politics of the Near East and the backgrounds of the local players. This will serve him well when times get tough, as they do, as we know. Though he's not yet fully comfortable, Josie hasn't arrived yet, Henry must accept a dinner invitation from the British ambassador, Sir Louis Mallet. He will be, it will be Henry's coming out party in the, in, in the diplomatic class. Josie's not arrived, so Henry is accompanied by his oldest daughter, Ruth, and her husband, Mortimer Fox. On arrival, they were late, a theme in our family that skips generations, but it's a theme. Um, Henry's nerves immediately take a back seat to the pomp of a full-blown diplomatic affair. The British embassy is even grander than his own. This is the US embassy here in this picture. Henry is introduced to the senior members of the Foreign Diplomatic Corps, but importantly, he also meets the Young Turks for the first time. Look at that. Um, so Enver Pasha, in the middle, was a military man. He was considered the most powerful of the trio. He was also the most elegant, dressed in his military finery, bedecked with medals. Jemal Pasha, on, uh, on the left, uh, was the least well-known. He was a naval officer, so he also wore his medals proudly. But his current role included chief of police of Constantinople. Finally, on the right, Talat Pasha, large, gruff, and as rough around the edges as Enver was polished. 
Of the diplomats, Henry is particularly taken with the German ambassador, Baron von Wangenheim, an imposing, though highly cultured character. The two withdraw from the dancing. This, this event lasted until, I think, 4 o'clock in the morning. Two or three meals were served. There was dancing. But Henry and von Wangenheim and uh, members of the British and Italian em embassies play bridge while all this is going on. And Henry uses this as a way to get to know von Wangenheim, who he identifies as being powerful because he's a friend of the Kaiser, which is a sure sign of power um, in, in, uh, in Austro-Hungary, Germany at that time. Um, but he also clearly um, is, is, is um, bowed down to or uh, by the other diplomats. And, and Henry has a sense that this is somebody who he needs to get to know and needs to get to know well. They form a kind of the, that kind of bond trusting yet suspicious, that seems right out of the pages of an espionage novel. Maybe that's my 21st century interpretation. Um, he's less enth enthralled with another German, Hans Humann, who was um, a seen also a member of the German delegation. Humann had a very close and long-standing relationship with Enver, who speaks German fluently. Some credit this relationship is crucial to bringing the Turks into the war on the side of the Central Powers, which of course was Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Bulgaria. Human was a particularly odious character. He publicly denied mass killings of Armenians and claiming at the same time that any violence that might have occurred would have been entirely justified. As hard as it is to do in retrospect, it's important to remember that the young Turks were first viewed as reformers trying to bring some form of democracy to replace the absolute monarchy of the Ottoman Empire. In a speech in 1908, Enver declared, today, arbitrary government has disappeared. We are all brothers. There are no longer in Turkey, Bulgarians, Greeks, Serbians, Romanians, Muslims, Jews. Under the same blue sky, we are proud to be Ottomans. Of course, on that list, there is no mention of Armenians. By the time Henry arrived, the democratic experience had long since failed. But in the Pashas, he recognized certain traits at first that he couldn't help but admire, particularly in Talat, a former letter carrier who had risen through the ranks to his position of power. And this was a position of power. These three young men, young at the time, ran the country, took over the country, and, and, and uh, they, were, they were the government, these three young men. Henry saw a parallel to American society and politics. He, it felt to him like it was the boss system where one could achieve power without the benefit of high birth. I think he saw a little bit of his own story in that. It will be Talat, therefore, that Henry turns to, to plead, threaten, and cajole because he thinks that he can develop the most commonality with Talat and have, have the, the most productive relationship for a guy who was a butcher. Josie arrived in the late winter of 1914. The Turks rolled out the red carpet for her, and her initial reluctance to join the diplomatic life vanished quickly. She was immediately swept up in the diplomatic swirl and found that she enjoyed it immensely. She also threw herself into volunteer work at schools, orphanages, and the American College for Girls, which had been formed by the Women's Board of Missions. Through that work, Josie became familiar with the Armenian, Greek, and Jewish communities in Constantinople. That and the fact that Henry's um, personal secretary was Armenian, an Armenian Turk, um, created, started to create a bond between Henry and Josie and ju not just the non-Turkish community, but specifically the Armenian community. That summer, Henry and Josie were joined by their daughter Alma, her husband Maurice Wertheim, and their three daughters, Alma, Barbara, and Anne. As they neared their destination, they witnessed a naval battle between German and British warships. Barbara was two years old, but would later write about the guns of August under, the mar under her married name, Barbara Tuckman. The heightened hostilities began to claim victims. Henry heard from sources in Palestine that because working age men had been conscripted and the normal flow of remittances, remittances threatened, Jewish settlers were in danger of being completely cut off. Unable to muster government resources through the State Department, 
Henry, Henry sent a telegram to his friend Jacob Schiff. Well, there's Bar Baron von Wangenheim, and there's Hans Heumann and Enver Pasha. I'm a little behind. All right, this is the telegram. Um, it reads, it's a little hard to read, obviously, but it reads, Palestine Jews facing terrible crisis, serious destruction threatens thriving colonies, $50,000 needed. Will you undertake the matter? Schiff mobilized his friends immediately and formed an organization now known as the Joint Distribution Committee. The joint refers to Henry's communication as the telegram, but it was just a warm-up. Conditions continue to deteriorate. Though the Ottomans still professed neutrality, the International Diplomatic Corps begins an exodus from Constantinople. By the fall of 2014, only the Americans, Brits, French, Russians, and Belgians maintain delegations in, in, in uh, Turkey. A dozen ambassadors have delegated their power to Henry. His mandate from home, however, is clear. Secretary William Jennings Bryant writes that Americans must stay out of the fight and that Turkey should be convinced to remain neutral for the sake of humanity. On October, 19, on October 29th, Henry calls on Talat to make his case for neutrality, but it's too late. Talat informs him that the decision to join the Central Powers has already been taken. The Ottomans will rely on Germany to protect them from Russia. The battleships, seen by Barbara Tuckman, now flying Turkish flags, but still under the command of German officers and crews, open fire on Odessa. Even in the absence of a formal declaration of war, it is no longer possible to hang on to the hope of Turkish neutrality. All the remaining embassies close. Ambassadors head home and lower ranking staff to their respective homes. Only the US delegation remained. Turkey began to mobilize by conscripting everyone of fighting age. This included Armenians, but they would not be soldiers. They would be transportation, literally human pack mules moving military supplies from ports and production in the West across the vast, inhospitable expanse of interior Anatolia to defend the Russian border in the East. Russia was the mortal enemy of Turkey, and this plays an important role. This was be the beginning of what Henry called, eventually, a campaign of race extermination. As we know, the word genocide did not yet exist for a number of years. As we know, it would also get far worse. Henry's receiving more and more reports from missionaries about atrocities committed by Turks across the region. At first, he's skeptical, but the communications are too num numerous and remain, and remain to remain skeptical for long. In addition, Baron von Wangenheim confirms that German missionaries were sending similar reports. Of course, Hans Heumann was denying that at the same time. On April 24, 1915, Henry hosts Talat Pasha for dinner at the U.S. Embassy and asks him outright about the killing of Armenians. Talat replied that Armenians were merely being relocated to a place where they could pose no threat to the government. He justified this action by saying it was necessary to quill, quell the threat of an Armenian-led revolt in sympathy with Russia. What Talat did not say was that they were being relocated to a place where they were killed. That very night, April 24th, 250 intellectuals and leaders of Armenian community in Constantinople were rounded up and murdered. And that night is recognized as the beginning of what now even the U.S. government recognizes as the Armenian Genocide. From home, the message remains clear. The U.S. government is neutral and cannot interfere with how a foreign government treats its own citizens. Henry does manage to get the State Department to agree to co-author with the French, British, and Russians an official diplomatic note charging the Turks with crimes against humanity. Henry delivered the note himself. The response from the Turks was that they resented the attempted interference by foreign states with the sovereign right of the Turkish government over their Armenian subjects. Back home, William Jennings Bryant was replaced by Robert Lansing as Secretary of State. Henry hoped Lansing would pro provide a more sympathetic year. This would not be the case. Lansing wrote, one of the blackest pages in the history of the war, more or less justifiable given the Armenians' well-known disloyalty to the government and the fact that the territory they inhabited 
was within the zone of military operations. The Department of State can make no other suggestion in connection with this most difficult situation other than that the ambassador continue to act as he has done. Lansing also admitted that the State Department was withholding from the American people the facts now in its possession. We're going to hear more of, of that kind of behavior later. One can only imagine Henry's reaction to the phrase, most difficult situation. Though growing increasingly frustrated, he continued to act as he had done by maintaining a relentless campaign with the Turkish leaders, particularly Enver and Talat. He'd become convinced that Talat was the chief architect of the rampage against the Armenians. So Henry set out to wear him down with repeated visits. Eventually, Talat lost patience and stopped bothering to even pretend ignorance. We are through with them, Talat said. That's all over. Making no headway through official channels, neither American nor Turkish, Henry turns to private philanthropy once again. Echoing the message of the telegram he sent to Jacob Schiff, Henry sent another message. Having wrangled an agreement with Enver to let some Armenian refugees leave Turkey, Henry sent a telegram requesting help from a consortium of business and religious leaders. He suggests that an appeal be made to his old friends Cleveland Dodge, Charles Crane, and Stephen Wise. Dodge is on the right, I was going to say with the bowler hat, except there are lots of bowler hats. There's some Hamburgs and some bowlers, clearly the style of the, of the time. Um, Henry is on the left, and that's a, a fellow named Dutton, who was a, a professor at Columbia, who um, lent uh, the gentleman his office for the first meeting of the uh, um, uh, what would become Near East Relief. The group convenes immediately and successfully. $60,000 is raised at the very first meeting, half of it coming from John D. Rockefeller. The circle is widened, and $100,000 is wired to Henry in Constantinople by October of 2015. The group initially took the name American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief and elected the Protestant missionary James Levi Barton as its chair. And so began, in the words of Barton, the narrative of American philanthropy. It is also a narrative of philanthropic communication. It is spreading the word. It is not just raising money, which it did incredibly successfully, but it spread the word about the atrocities in Armenia so that all of America knew exactly what was going on, which was critically important. What started with a few wealthy donors spread into a massive campaign of public giving that would be envied even today. In all, over a 10-year period, they raised $116 million, which would be about the equivalent of a billion and a half dollars today. Methods were as creative as the cause was justified. Ravished Armenia was the story of a teenage survivor, Aurora Mardiganian, it was published in 1918. A movie followed the following year, retitled Auction of Souls. It was a very popular movie, but years later, Martiganian confessed the details in the book were severely toned down by the publisher. Her real experience was much, much worse. Unfortunately, I don't believe there is any copy of the movie left, but the book is still available. Also in 2018, my great-grandfather published Ambassador Morgenthau's story. Having resigned his position out of frustration in 1916, he dedicated himself to raising funds and raising awareness for the plight of the survivors and, and refugees. As English was his second language, Henry hired a ghostwriter. I recently saw a program on Turkish state-sponsored te television that used the ghostwriter angle as central to its case that the book was nothing but propaganda. Much later, Austrian Franz Werfel wrote 40 Days of Musadakh, based on the heroic self-defense by a small Armenian community living near Musadakh, a mountain which, near what is now Syria, close to the Mediterranean. Interestingly, the book was first published in Germany. It was very popular, but in retrospect, it presaged, obviously, another mass atrocity. Near East Relief began to publish its own per periodical, The New Near East. The January 1922 issue featured a promotion of Alice in Hungerland. The movie tells the story of an American girl who stows away to visit her father, a Near East relief worker, in Constantinople. Not coincidentally, the film was produced by Near East Relief itself. Most famous of all was this guy. 
if you're as old as I am, you recognize him as Uncle Fester of the Adams Family TV series. But Jackie Coogan was the most popular child actor of his time. He was discovered by Charlie Chaplin at a vaudeville show in Los Angeles, and Jackie was cast in Chaplin's enormously successful silent picture, The Kid. His page boy haircut became instantly recognizable. He was an inexhaustible spokesperson and an incredible resource for Near East relief. Jackie promoted food drives. He promoted clothing drives. He showed up for event after event, and kids showed up too, with coins in their pockets to contribute to the cause. In this way, Near East Relief was actually sowing the seeds of future fundraising as it created an, an entire class of young philanthropists. Less famous today, but famous then, was Norma Talmadge, a silent film star who did not make the transition to the talkies, but she led a campaign focused on pro providing primary foodstuffs, say it with flour. Golden Rule Sunday was also a creation of Near East Relief. Each year on a Sunday in early December, families were encouraged to restrict their meals to what an orphan or refugee might have available. The fundraising appeal was that the families should then donate to Near East Relief the difference in what they spent on the refugee meal to, um, uh, from their uh, normal meal. This turned out to be enormously expensive, successful fundraiser for many, many years. This particular poster for the 1926 version was the first prize winner of the Henry Morgenthau poster poem slogan, keeping it wide open for all different kinds of uh, solicit uh, contributions, contest in, in the fall. That contest was in the fall of 1926, a contest he continued to fund for many years. There were also things like appeal booklets, which created $1 coupons that people could buy that would support the life of an Armenian child for a week. All this is not just fundraising. It's what I think fundraisers today would call friend raising. It is making people aware and bringing people into the, the, um, uh, the process of helping and, and humanizing what had been dehumanized. We all know that genocide is a process of dehumanizing people, but the Near East relief through this system of fundraising not only raised a lot of money, but they created a humanizing impact um, for, the Ameri for Americans um, in their view of, of Armenians and other victims of, of that genocide. This was a rug that was woven by Armenians or Armenian orphans living in a Near East relief um, camp in uh, Lebanon. It was presented to President Calvin Coolidge with the inscription on the back that says, in golden rule gratitude to Coolidge. The rug occupied the blue room of the White House until the end of Coolidge's term, and he took it back to his home in Northampton, Massachusetts. But the family returned it to the White House in 1982. It's rarely seen the light of day since then. In, 19, in 2013, a curator at the Smithsonian asked to display the rug for a single afternoon. The, right the White House refused and issued the following statement. Displaying the rug for only half a day in connection with a private book launch event, as proposed, would have been an inappropriate use of U.S. government property, would have required the White House to undertake the risk of transporting the rug for limited public exposure and was not viewed as commensurate with the rug's historical significance. Talk about doublespeak. This was during the Obama administration. Obama, President Obama raised a lot of money from Armenians on the promise that he, his administration would recognize the Armenian genocide, would call it for what it was, and of course we know they never did. Before we leave Henry, um, I'd just like to say a few personal words. First and foremost, Armenians' loyalty to the legacy of my great-grandfather is truly humbling. More than 100 years later, my many cousins and I are received warmly and treated with a level of gratitude that, of course, none of us personally deserve, but we are enormously grateful. Second, Cleveland Dodge and his family were and continue to be hugely generous. Dodge was a Scotch Presbyterian and felt a certain amount of guilt over profiting from selling copper for the manufacturing of munitions during war. At about the same time he responded to Henry's telegram, he started the Dodge Family Foundation, 
with an initial contribution of $5 million, a lot of money in 2013, or in 1915, actually. The foundation is still active today. Family members can request contributions, but only to charities in which the member is actively involved. The Near East Foundation, renamed, which is the renaming uh, today, is still in business today, and it's one of the organizations that the Dodge Foundation continues to fund and has continuously since 1915. In fact, and thanks, because Cleveland Dodge's great-grandson, Johnson Garrett, serves on the board. And is, in a complete coincidence, my wife and I raised our kids and currently live in a house built by the Dodge family in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. When we moved in, we pulled away from bookshelves from the wall and found old punch magazines that were used as insulation. They were very thrifty, the Dodges. Um, and they gave away their money, which is why they were so thrifty, which is really a fantastic story. Um, one last story about Henry before we leave. Frustrated by his lack of success through regular State Department channels, he decided to try what might be charitably called a workaround. Spurred by signals that he felt he was getting from Baron von Wengenheim, Henry thought it might be able to negotiate a separate peace with Germany. Bold? Yes. Naive? Yeah, that too. As his emissary, he dispatched his 23-year-old son, Henry Jr., to London to float the plan. While it obviously didn't succeed, two things were accomplished. Henry Jr. grew in confidence and stature, and perhaps even more important, he learned from his father that one does not always need to play by the rules. Henry Jr. received a fair amount of positive attention for his role in the mission. When asked by the New York Times, by a New York Times reporter, if he would continue in diplomacy, he replied, my time as the ambassador's assistant is over. I am a farmer. This is Henry Jr. at his apple farm, um, quite immature at the time, um, the apples. Um, he chose being a farmer because, as he claimed, it was the one thing his father knew nothing about. The two were very different. While Sr. excelled in the classroom, Henry Jr. struggled. He was very likely an undiagnosed dyslexic. Sr. had the confidence of a self-made man who at the same time was thrust into that early role of head of the family. He was an overbearing father, to put it politely. He was also a sexist. When it came to raising the children, he told Josie, you take the girls, I'll take Henry. This did Henry no favors. Henry Sr. had lots of advice to give and lots of rules to follow. It's not hard to venture that his son seemed more comfortable following the rules as best he could. In the end, his academic career landed him at the Cornell School of Agriculture, where he finally discovered his call calling. He also discovered his soulmate, Eleanor Fatman, a granddaughter of Meyer Lehman. Ellie was a force, whether on the apple farm in Dutchess County, where it still exists today, or in the political swamp of Washington, D.C., she was a companion, advisor, and sounding board. She also played a crucial role in the second most important relationship of Henry's life. The family farm was and still is in the Hudson Valley town of Fishkill, New York. Hyde Park, the Roosevelt residence, was about a 20-minute car ride away. As Franklin liked to say, the Morgenthaus and the Roosevelts were the only Democrats in Dutchess County. So it seemed natural that they would make each other's acquaintance, and certainly Henry Sr. made sure that that happened. Henry was no gentleman farmer, though. In 1922, he acquired the American Agriculturist, the oldest farm publication in the East. It was fading, and it was a turnaround story, but Henry made it work. He brought in a new editor. And he encouraged the editor to make the articles more practical and less scientific. Henry was championing the common farmer. In 1924, the agriculturalist published an editorial asking readers to send Governor Al Smith a petition for tax relief. Smith responded by inviting Henry to give him advice on farm matters. Even Senior could not have manufactured the closeness of the relationship between Henry and Franklin. Franklin admired Henry's work. And when Roosevelt was elected governor, he made Henry the commissioner of conservation. So when your family uh, pursues public service over a long period of time, you can mount an entire exhibition of swearing-in photos. 
This is not the last one you're going to see. Um, in this picture, Henry Sr. and Josie, there's Henry Sr. and Josie. Josie's all the way on the left. Um, Henry Jr. with his right hand raised. Um, uh, Edward Flynn was the Secretary of State of New York swearing him in. Ellie, Henry's wife, and my father, age 12 on the far right. My Aunt Joan, age 8, uh, sitting near uh, Roosevelt's knee. As Henry and Franklin grew closer, so did Ellie and Eleanor. I have to call her Ellie because I, can't, I just can't do Eleanor and Eleanor. So Ellie is my grandmother. Eleanor is, is the first lady. Two strong women who more than occasionally needed to goad their husbands down the right path. The relationship was four square. Both couples equally enjoyed the company of each other. Now, if you'll pardon me here, I have a little technology work to do, and I am technology challenged, so we'll see how it goes. It's going to be a home movie shot in the backyard of Henry and Eleanor's house in Fishkill. Uh, the Roosevelts loved to visit, in part because Franklin was an avid driver. He drove a little too fast, which I think it was probably a 30-minute drive, except when Franklin was at the wheel, it was only 20. On this occasion, there was a special guest who I think you can recognize from the, from the photo. Had the video worked, you might have observed that only Winston Churchill was drinking from a clear glass. My father, in his naval uniform, he was one year into the Navy, and he was a pretty good bartender by then, by his own admission. Um, made mint juleps for everybody. Churchill took one sip, rejected it as too sweet, and asked for real whiskey. He was poured about this much real whiskey, and I'm not sure that was the only one. Um, in addition to the real whiskey, the joviality was due to the fact, at least in part, that Henry Jr. had developed a strong relationship with Winston, because he played a significant role in helping to arm Great Britain. Lend-Lease was a clever plan to circumvent the Neutrality Act, which prevented the outright sale of arms to countries in conflict. Remember, the United States was very isolationist at the time. Franklin gave Henry the task of shepherding through a relatively hostile con Congress the bill authorizing Lend-Lease. Even the most ardent -eyed isolationists well, they would never vote to authorize, but there was enough in the middle ground to get the job done. With advice from Ellie, Henry managed to convince enough swing voters to get the legislation passed. This is not a story about Lend-Lease. When Henry Sr. spread the word about the Armenian genocide, he was the spark of a mass campaign of philanthropy. His story was told and retold to millions. To create the War Refugee Board, Henry was called on to spread the word to an audience of one his very closest friend, Franklin Roosevelt. That story starts in August of 42 or 43 at the American Consulate in Geneva. Gerhard Riegner is a representative of the World Jewish Congress. He arrived unannounced at the, U at the American Consulate and asked to speak to the most senior person available. It was August, so the most senior person was the not particularly senior Howard Elting. Riegner told Elting that the Nazis were planning to execute millions of Jews. While the claim seemed gruesomely outlandish, it corresponded with recent confirmed reports of mass arrests in Paris, Vienna, Berlin, and elsewhere. Riegner asked Elting to pass the news through channels to Stephen Wise, the same Stephen Wise that, that counseled Henry Sr. Elting believed Riegner, Elting believed Riegner, and immediately transmitted the telegram to his superior in Bern. Elting wrote, my personal opinion is that Riegner is a serious and balanced individual and that he would never have come to the consulate with the above report if he had not had confidence in, the, in his informant's reliability. Unfortunately, Elting's superior, Leland Harrison, did not agree. Before sending the, Europe the uh, telegram to the European desk in Washington, he appended his own message. The report has the earmarks of war rumor inspired by fear, he wrote. In DC, there was greater faith in Harrison's assessment, and the telegram was buried. It was never passed along to Stephen Wise. Fortunately, Gerhard Riegner was a belt and suspenders kind of guy, and he also paid a visit to the British Embassy. After some debate, the Brits passed the message to Stephen Wise. Wise had continues his interest in politics. He was a Roosevelt supporter, 
and had a relationship with Under Secretary of State Sumner Wells. Wells did not dismiss Regner's claims and promised to investigate, but it was two full months before he was able to report the results to Wise. Time moved incredibly slowly in the political environment, much less slowly than it moved in the wartime environment, unfortunately. Sumner confirmed Regner's fears. Wise went public with the information, but the State Department immediately urged him and others to tone down their rhetoric. Tone down their rhetoric. American troops were too far from the death camps to allow for any type of mass rescue. Many in state felt that the protests would force allies to take steps that might detract from the overall war effort. During the, this period, Regner also transmitted a different message. He felt that he could rescue Jews trapped in France and Romania, but he needed money to do it. Passed through the State Department channels, the request came to the attention of Bernard Meltzer, who was the State Department's foreign funds control liaison. John Paley at Treasury oversaw foreign funds control. So the way it worked was State Department approved the money being sent, and then Treasury sent it. And State Department had to create what were called licenses to sp send money um, uh, anywhere in the world. But Europe obviously was particularly uh, dicey area because there was a war going on and the State Department definitely never wanted money to get behind enemy lines or, or money that might get in, fall into the hands of enemy. They also wanted to make sure that money was never used for bribery. Leland Harrison weighed in from Bern, always concerned that, that money might fall into the enemy hands. He used, he issued the standard response which was current prohibitions against financial or commercial arrangements with enemy territory cannot be relaxed. So once again, the request is buried. However, after meeting with officials of the World Jewish Con Congress in Washington and being assured that the Red Cross would be involved, Pele reversed the course and approved the transfer. And then he ran into Breckenridge Long who was the Assistant Secretary of State. Long was a Princeton grad and Roosevelt fundraiser. He had been the ambassador to Italy until 1936. He, he stepped down with the official story that um, uh, it was for health reasons. But really, it was most likely that he took a too friendly view of Italy's invasion of Ethiopia. He rejoined state in 39 as head of special war problems, which unfortunately included oversight of the visa division. Long flat out lies to Congress about visas, saying that 580,000 visas were issued to Jewish refugees. That was three times the actual number. And fortunately, he got caught lying, and it was publicized in an article in the New York Times and then widespread um, that he absolutely misled Congress. He, he, he made these statements in a closed door setting, but um, they were leaked and, and, and he was found out. Uh, worse than Long, was Borden Reams. He was, he was on Breckenridge's long staff, and he was a career diplomat. He'd worked as a salesman before passing the civil service exam. He called Re the Regner telegram fantastical. He urged Stephen Wise to keep it quiet, to stop with the publicity. He lied about negotiations with various governments on rec rec um, refugee evacuation. And finally, he said, I do not believe that we can or should accede to the desire of Treasury. This proposal is objectionable. Remember, this proposal was to send $170,000 for the purpose of rescuing Romanian and French refugees. Doesn't seem objectionable to me. Henry was no stranger to the anti-Semitic tropes that were used in war propaganda. This poster, with his likeness, reads, 92% of New York finance, of U.S. finance, passes through Jewish hands. Nor was he surprised by similar views expressed within certain corners of the State Department. For Regner to have access to the money, he needed to receive a license from the State Department. Thanks to Long and Reams, no license was granted. In the State Department, this was, this was a, um, uh, issued as a report. This is not somebody talking. I'm going to read it just in case it's a little hard to read. Many Jewish relief, relief organizations are, quote unquote, tricky, deceitful, and absolutely unreliable. 
Those charged with national security cannot afford under any circumstances to predicate their actions upon the representations or statements of any of these groups. Randolph Paul was general counsel in Treasury. After the war, he would go on to be the founder of the still prestigious law firm Paul Weiss, Wharton, and Garrison. He was in his 50s, so he was often the adult in the room among the younger members of the, of the department. As State Department is delaying the Regner license, he says at a staff meeting, you know, there are certain elements in the State Department which, as you may well imagine, are opposed to it. I can't imagine, was Henry's sarcastic response. One of the reasons why the scholarly work is so good on this is that my grandfather had every word of every meeting transcribed. It was either recorded or he had a stenographer. There is a vast amount. You can literally read every Treasury Department meeting in which he was present um, in, in, the, um, uh, in the National Archives, if, if you have the time. Um, like others in the Treasury Department, including especially John Paley, Paul, Randolph Paul was fed up. He recruited Paley and Josiah Du Bois to draft a memo outlining the intransigence of the State Department and its human cost. On January 13, 1944, Paul, Paley, and Du Bois presented an 18-page memo to their boss. The title did not mince words. Report to the Secretary on the acquiescence of this government in the murder of the Jews. Their aim was to give Henry have Henry go straight to the president. The report was detailed, it was factual, and it was urgent. A more compact version of the memo was drafted, retitled simply, Personal Report to the President. Henry loved the original title, but he knew the president would not. But if he put personal report, he knew that he could work his personal relationship with the president to get the kind of decision that they wanted. Randolph Paul, John Paley accompanied Henry to the White House, Henry steeled himself for a difficult conversation, but opened on the offensive, thanks to advice from Ellie. There are the facts, Mr. President, the most shocking thing I have found since I have been in Washington. Here we find ourselves aiding and abetting, and abetting Hitler. How can, what can we do at this very late date to try to make up for lost time? Roosevelt was persuaded and charged Henry with working, working directly with Cordell Hull, Secretary of State, um, to get this done. Unfortunately, the sympathetic Sumner Wells had left the department under somewhat shadowy circumstances. The new undersecretary, Edward Statinius, was an unknown commodity. A former Gen General Motors executive, Statinius turned out to be both sympathetic and efficient. The War Refugee Board was created with what could be termed lightning speed for the time. By the end of January, Roosevelt announced that the board would be formed under the secretaries, nominally under the four secretaries of Treasury, State, and War, Morgenthau, Hull, and Henry Stimson. Importantly, it would be overseen and staffed by the Treasury Department exclusively. John Paley became its chief. It was too little too late, but the War Refugee Board did accomplish some important goals. Its work was key to saving 200,000 Hungarian Jews, and $11 million was dispersed on other relief efforts. Paley, Paul, and Dubois deserve most of the credit, but the board would not have existed without the bond of, trans, of trust between Henry and FDR. As the War Refugee Board came into being, my father, Robert Morgenthau, second in command on the destroyer escort USS Lansdale, was sailing west from Norfolk, Virginia shipyards to join the battle in the Mediterranean. For the next three months, using Casablanca as a home base, the Lansdale escorted convoys through the dangerous straits of Gibraltar. So this is an aerial shot of the port. The ship is a French um, heavy cruiser. And to give you a sense of scale, that ship is about twice as long, actually more than twice as long as the Lansdale. The Lansdale, my father would say, was like spending the war floating in a, in a floating tin can. He was there in, um, in April of, of 1944. Passover was April 8th, first night of Passover. And um, naval officers were invited to join prominent um, Moroccan families, Moroccan Jewish families, for the Passover celebration. My father was not particularly observant, um, but he knew a good free meal when he saw one. 
Um, and so and so he went uh, he he went to join the Passover celebration of a Sephardic family called Pinto. Um, one thing he remembers from that is that there was a really cute three or four year old girl dressed to the tees for the you know for the event, and she was passing chocolates on a silver tray to the guests after dinner. One chocolate for a guest, one chocolate for her, one chocolate for another guest, one chocolate for her. It was a memory that, that indelibly stuck with him. And it's kind of amazing because 10 days later, the Lansdale set straight for the uh, sail for the Straits of Gibraltar, headed for Bizert, Tunisia. The convoy made it safely through the Straits, but was attacked by German planes near Algiers. Lansdale was positioned between the attackers and the convoy. That was its job. Um, and it bore the brunt of the assault. She was hit by a torpedo, and after um, it, it disabled her rudder, and she spun in circles for, I don't know, an hour, half an hour before tilting over and sinking. My father was the second, la second to last man off the ship, and he floated in the Mediterranean for hours, knowing full well that other ships in the convoy were under strict orders to continue en route and not go back to pick up survivors. In my father wor father's words, he made a deal with the Almighty, although he had very little leverage at the time. In the highly unlikely event that he was rescued, he would devote his life to public service. I guess I'm living proof that he had to make good on that deal. Two ships, the Menges and the Newell, countermanded officers, countermanded their orders, and returned for the surviving sailors. Miraculously, Less than 50 of the 280 sailors aboard the Lansdale were lost. Really extraordinary. After the war, Robert entered Yale Law School. Upon graduation, he made the rounds of all the top law firms looking for a job. He learned very quickly that proclaiming an interest in public service was not a successful interview technique. However, Patterson, Belknap, and Webb, a leading, also a leading firm, was different. Robert P. Patterson was a decorated soldier in the Great War and a well-known jurist. He had left the bench at the age of 49 in 1940 to re-enlist in the Army to fight against Germany. FDR had other ideas for him, and Patterson became Under Secretary of War and was put in charge of procurement. His story is an incredible one. He was an amazing executive, and the fact that our factories could go from not making any tanks at all to making the number of tanks and warplanes is largely a credit to Robert P. Patterson. Um, he offered my father a job. My father said nothing about public service when he had the interview at Patterson Belknap. He'd learned his lesson, but he got offered a job anyway. And then Patterson said, um, you know, at some point you really need to go into public service. He knew he'd picked the right place. So Patterson would become an important mentor to my dad. Patterson went down in a plane crash on the way to a meeting, a client meeting in, in uh, Buffalo. Um, the plane flew in a storm. My father was supposed to go, but he, um, uh, he, had, he got sent back to uh, rewrite some briefs and didn't make the trip. So another, another close rush. Um, after a decade in private practice and with four children, there would eventually be seven, Robert made ready to make the leap to the public sector. He ran the state campaign for his childhood friend, Jack Kennedy. Publicly reserved, like his father, the political sphere was not a natural environment for my dad. But he knew where the bodies were buried, and also, like, he, like his dad, he attracted talented people to his staff. He was rewarded by being appointed the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. After an unsuccessful run for governor against Nelson Rockefeller, he didn't stand a chance, but his lack of charisma on the stump did not help. He returned to his post in the Southern District, where he stayed until Richard Nixon became president. It was the usual practice for attor U.S. attorneys to offer their resignations when a new party took office. My father was not so inclined and instead investigated Nixon for unlawfully placing funds in Swiss bank accounts. In 1970, he was fired. He spent five unhappy years in public practice, but jumped back into the fray in 1974. Frank Hogan, the long-serving Manhattan District Attorney had died in office, and a special election for replacement was held. His opponent was a acting DA, Richard Q, who was best known for persecuting Lenny Bruce. The race was not particularly close. Um, he finally retired from that position in 2009 at the age of 90. This is the first of, his, of nine swearing-in ceremonies. I promise I'm not going to show any of the others. 
Um, the fellow in the back with the extravagant hair is your speaker. Um, <laughs> Robert's goal was to give the local prosecutor's office the same level of prestige as his formal, former federal prosecutor's office. He set out to hire the best people. He wanted hungry young lawyers and didn't care where they, what law schools they came from. He hired Sonia Sotomayor from his alma mater, the Yale Law School, when unbelievably no white shoe for firm would hire her. She could not get a job at the top, top law firm, despite graduating from Yale, which is arguably the top law school. Um, uh, and no one would take her, but he did, and he, and he would. Um, he last took his oath, um, swore, his last swearing in was at her Senate confirmation hearings in 2009. Um, to attract the best lawyers and keep them, he needed to have the best cases. And to do that, he routinely ignored the unspoken unspo rules between federal and state prosecutors about jurisdiction. My jurisdiction is set by any dollar that crosses any bank in New York County. Well, as we know, the biggest banks in the world are in New York County. So that meant his jurisdiction on financial crimes was basically all crimes. He was very close to his grandfather, Henry Sr., and had learned well the wisdom and art of bending the rules. Like his parents and grandparents, he was not a particularly observant Jew. For many years, our family could accurately be labeled as once-a-year Jews, only attending services on Yom Kippur. That changed somewhat when Robert made an extraordinary discovery. Steve Kaufman, a chief assistant in the U.S. Attorney's Office who had become a close friend, visited Robert to announce his engagement. He was to be married to a UN translator, a Sephardic Jew of Swiss-Moroccan descent. Her name <coughs> was Marina Pinto, and she was the little girl with a tray of chocolates. It, it resonated with him in, in, a, in, in both a religious and a, um, a, a way that maybe she or maybe somebody was looking out for him when he was, when he was floating in the water. There was another moment that Robert pointed to as raising his awareness of general anti-Semitism. He was in Frankfurt, visiting Germany for the first time since before World War II. Preparing to leave his hotel for the airport, his cab driver looked at him and asked, which airline, El Al? My father told that story frequently with a cautionary punchline, you better know who you are because everybody else does. In this frame of mind, he reluctantly accepted Mayor Ed Koch's invitation quote, unquote, to co-chair the New York Task Force on the Holocaust. Koch had hoped for a federally funded Holocaust Museum in New York, but when Washington was chosen as the site for the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, Koch pointed out New York remained the cultural and spiritual nucleus of American Jewry and home to the largest number of Holocaust survivors in the United States. A task force was created with real estate developer and Holocaust survivor George Klein as the chair. There was a bold plan to house the museum in a newly developed residential tower. Unfortunately, the plan failed. The commission was in a bit of disarray, and Koch asked my father to help Klein get the committee back on track. The Morgenthau name and his stature in New York City would be important assets, but Robert was much better at locking people up than he was at asking for money. In fact, he was terrible at it. Fortunately, his two long-serving secretaries, Josephine Joe Gersio and Ida Van Lint, were really good at getting prospective donors on the telephone. Enlisting the help of Peter Cohn, chairman of Shearson Lehman Brothers at the time, Robert made the rounds and the money started flowing in. But the museum still needed a home. My father reached out to Harry Albright, the chairman of Battery Park City Association, owner, which owned a big swath of undeveloped landfill at the southern tip of Manhattan. A deal was struck, and a lease was signed by a rogues gallery of politicians. From left to right, we have Senator Al D'Amato, State Senator Manfred Orenstein, who, like Henry Sr., was born in Mannheim. My father, George Klein, his co-chair, Ed Koch, and Governor Mario Cuomo. There's another lease signing with um, Rudy Giuliani in it, but I declined to show it. Um, it's a nice publicity shot, but you turn the camera around, and it's important and then parent how much work needed to be done. That's the site. Um, that's the World Trade Center, the bottom of the World Trade Center in the background. 
Um, this is the museum as it looks today. It was built in two stages. The six-sided building came first. It was designed by the architect Kevin Roach to honor both the Star of David and the six million Jews who were mur murdered in the, in the Holocaust. Construction for the rectangular east wing was started in the fall of 2001. It was the first shovel in the ground in lower Manhattan after 9-11. Many museum trustees were cautious and advised waiting until the financial ramifications of the World Trade Center bombings were better known. But my dad refused to wait. He said, we need to show the world that life goes on. My father remained chair of the museum until just a couple of years before he died. Along the way, he recruited me to join the board. He was a laissez-faire parent, as you could have seen from the hair in my in his swearing in, my hair in his swearing in, about which he never said a word. He never offered advice to any of his children unless asked directly, but he also never asked of us anything until he offered me the option of joining the board of either of his two favorite organizations. And when a parent asks something for the first time, it's a good idea to pay attention. It's been an incredibly rewarding experience. In a sense, at the museum we serve two masters. Given New York's population, we must serve the Jewish community as a place to pass down from generation to generation memories of the Holocaust, the never forget mandate. But we do not want to limit our audience. Kurt Weil, ah, there we go. Um, Kurt Weil composed the score of the anti-Nazi extravaganza, We Will Never Die in 1943. It sold out Madison Square, Square Garden twice and traveled to several uh, cities that had large Jewish populations. The aim was to aware, raise awareness of the plight of Jews in Europe. At the Museum of Jewish Heritage, we share Weil's worry. Weil's worry. We don't want to just say that all we have accomplished is making a lot of Jews cry. We want to have a speak to a broader audience. We want to spread the word to more people than just the Jewish community. Uh, obviously. The Jewish community is critical and central to our, our mandate, but so is, is, is working beyond it. Um, we view that we have a duty to educate and help stop anti-Semitism, and specifically hatred in general. To that end, we focus on high school students. We've developed a wonderful program aimed at teenagers. And while it is still possible, we have a core, of group, core group of survivors who love to speak to the kids. They, have a, they leave a lasting impression, but we know that they'll not be around forever. While he was still governor, Andrew Cuomo announced a mandate that every student in New York should receive Holocaust education and receive it at our museum. Unfortunately, his hasty departure from office and COVID have proven to be minor um, obstacles, but the program is gaining momentum. What is well known, I am sure, by geno genocide scholars and becoming increasingly clear to me as I delved into my ancestors' story and as I sat through the sessions today, it's a recurring theme, is that refugees always present a central challenge. Nobody wants them. It's a central truth that no country wants to open its border to refugees. You know, they might be spies or foreign agents. Certainly, they wor countries worry that the refugees what might present a drain on public resources, or maybe they just don't fit in. But it is a central theme. So we see it at our mission to address these attitudes at a young age by trying to make it cool to rescue and provide help for refugees. I have a movie, but seeing as my last movie didn't work, I'm just going to talk through it. Um, the Gerda III was a Danish light ship tender. During the war, its captain and his daughter smuggled hundreds of Jews from Denmark to save hands in Sweden. Many were already refugees who had escaped to Denmark, thinking it was safe until it was, of course, occupied by Nazis. And so those Jews had to escape all over again. The boat's only 42 foot long, and it was donated to the museum by the Danish government. We're building an exhibit around her aimed at 9 to 12 year olds called Courage to Act. The thing about this group is most Holocaust museums um, uh, advise not to bring children under high school or, or, or um, at least middle school age. They advise that the material is often uh, too difficult for younger children. And it is, it is in general too difficult. But at nine years old, educators will tell us children start 
to think about fairness and they start to think about um, um, treating others as they like to be treated. And so it is an incredibly important age to reach, reach children. Uh, what we are doing in this exhibit is we're, we're building a model of the Goethe Three and, and introducing the kids to the concept of um, people righteously saving others and then bringing them to a country where they know no one, have no contacts, and they're, they're refugees. And trying to let these kids understand what an incredible thing that was, not just an act of, of wartime bravery, but an act of generosity um, and just the right thing to do. And um, we, think that, uh, we think that this is going to be a very, very successful exhibition because um, uh, we know that um, children will come and children will bring their parents um, and their parents uh, will bring their friends. Um, and and uh, it's, a little bit like, uh, it's a little bit like Jackie Coogan. So we're working hard to spread the word more broadly and develop more foot traffic. Everybody, anybody here who comes to New York, please come visit us. Please let me know if you are. And any and all suggestions um, are welcome. So in, to conclude, I've thought a great deal about what I might learn from these three characters. I'm fortunate to have such good examples. When thinking about communication, it's hard, to get, it's hard not to get sidetracked by the changing state of technology. Henry Sr. could send telegrams to communicate relatively quickly, but they were not at all secure. The Turks intercepted and read everything he wrote. To securely communicate with the State Department or people back home, a message had to be delivered by hand, which meant it had to cross the ocean on a boat, not an airplane. Even in Henry Jr.'s time, telegrams were nowhere near as ubiquitous as email is today. His diaries include numerous mentions about how expensive it was to send telegrams, even among government agencies. A more important lesson, I think, comes from what each one did when the traditional path led nowhere. At first, Henry Sr. did what an ambassador does. He tried to enlist the support of his own government. When that failed, he reached out to his, gen his generous friends. He tried to negotiate directly with young Turks. He tried to negotiate directly with Germany. When those failed, he came to the conclusion that he could be more helpful at home and turned his attention to fundraising. He was just a part of the success of Near East, but overall, it was an extraordinary effort. Henry Jr. and his team at Treasury saw their efforts thwarted by the intransigent State Department. It took time, but his staff built a strong body of evidence of the willfully turned blind eye of certain powerful members of that agency. Henry presented the plan to his boss and close friend that simply took responsibility out of State Department and placed it in Treasury. Robert, a once reluctant fundraiser, developed a real skill and zeal when he had something that he believed in and at the same time understood would not succeed without his efforts. There was an institutional will to have a Holocaust museum in New York, but getting ground level support proved to be difficult. When the first location didn't work, he found another. When 9-11 postponed plans, he insisted on getting shovels in the ground as fast as possible. The site of the museum is beautiful. We look out onto New York Harbor with a direct view of the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. But it's not Fifth Avenue. There's very little foot traffic. So we bring visitors to us. We focus on young students to give us an audience. Support from the governor and a generous donor who owns a bus company, which helps a lot, help us bring those school students when, when the schools themselves can't afford to send, send people. Our new exhibition will bring in an even younger audience. And as I said, like Jackie Coogan rallies, the kids will bring their parents, and we'll be communicating with two generations at once. Each of these three knew when to change course, and they weren't afraid to go outside the established norms of their positions. Sometimes, sometimes we need to break the rules to make things happen. Thank you. All right, thank you uh, for your family story and presentation. Um, we'll, can you hear me? Yeah, we've got about uh, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, if I'm checking my phone, it's not texting or anything like that. I'll be 
monitoring questions from ASU Live. Um, but let's turn to the room first if uh, anyone's got any questions for uh, Bob. It's only 100 years that I covered, so. Yeah. <laughs> Journey. Oh, you, you got a shoulder. Do you have a question? Oh. Hi, my name's Journey Orcanian. Um, it was an honor to hear you speak today. I'm graduating in May. He's my professor, and I spent about four years learning your family's work and reading articles and writing papers. So it was a really honor. Uh oh, did I get speak. it right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it right. sounded good to me. Um, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I did have a question when you were talking about the bow and the new expedition and having it be for nine-year-olds and how um, introducing it to a younger crowd is hard, and I understand that. My family is Armenian and Jewish, so I've grown up wow. learning both from a very young age and having those conversations and seeing the remnants of what that's caused from a young age. And I know we talked a lot about it in our classes, um, but do you think it's important to show the realities of what happened to younger ages or do you think starting at nine so that they can fully grasp it because it is hard but the reality also is is that it was horrible and it happened to a lot of young kids as well yeah so i think i think um what we're going to do is we're going to show certain realities we're going to show the reality of being taken away from your your life from um um, having to go to a totally strange place where you may or may not know anybody, well, where you won't know anybody. Uh, we're going to show the fear of that journey. We're not going to show pictures of people at, at concentration camps. We're not going to show emaciated bodies. We're not going to, we're going to try to um, uh, introduce the subject in a way that doesn't scare, scare the kids, but communicates how incredibly unfair it was. Because as I said, at nine years old, fairness starts to become really important. And as we know, developmentally, when things start to become important, they become incredibly important, right? And so we feel like we can, we can reach children with this concept of, of unfairness and scare them a little bit. Um, there's a great story, uh, it's a, sort of a terrifying story, um, that, that one of the escapees tells, um, uh, she was, um, the, the, the um, uh, refugees were hidden under the deck of the boat. Now, it's not a very big boat, right? So, um, and they were in an incredibly tight space. And from time to time, the boat would get boarded by German patrols. And they could hear them stomping around on top. And um, this particular voyage, they got boarded three times by German patrols. And then the fourth time, they were, they were boarded, and they could hear the stomping and the hatch opened and they thought, oh my God, it's over. And there was a tall, blonde man in a military uniform who said, welcome to Sweden. Um, and it was just an incredibly touching story. And these are the kinds of things that if we can, we can wrap these into a way we can get kids to understand and, and, and not scare them away. There's plenty of time to show them the more um, uh, gruesome images of the Holocaust. But if they're interested to begin with, then they'll come back when they're 15, 16, 17, and can handle handle the tougher things. Oh, for the live stream, I'll give you the microphone. It's not really a question. It's more an observation on the basis of the material, the very rich material that you share with us. The importance of individuals, especially within institutions, how the story could have been different if the various players, the various acting personae, would have been less anti-Semitic or less, uh, you know, with this prejudice or that prejudice. So since you know the, the way the State Department works, and you comment a little bit on that, the importance of the person who has power to make decisions. The, the State Department and the Treasury Department were very different in the makeup of their people. And the uh, State Department was more political patronage Treasury Department um, had a lot of lawyers. And all the people that, that I mentioned in the Treasury Department were lawyers by background. And Randolph Paul was, became a, 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 a very well-known and famous lawyer, at least for his firm. It's really still one of the top firms of the day. Um, but uh, Bernard Meltzer was an exception in state because he was also a lawyer. But, 
But Josiah Dubois was a, uh, a prodigy. He was the youngest of the group, and Paley was a lawyer. Um, and, and so my grandfather um, knew that his, the key to his success would be to having an incredibly strong staff. So he hired no political patrons, patronage jobs. He gave no political patronage jobs. He gave it based on merit. And he hired strong people and gave them plenty of latitude um, as long as they reported in. But he didn't second guess them and he didn't judge them. Um, uh, but there was a fair amount of control. State Department had a lot of political patronage jobs. Uh, it recycled some people. Some were sympathetic and some were not. Sumner Wells was actually quite sympathetic, um, but he, the, the, um, uh, the reason for his departure, his very sudden departure, was um, he, he was caught propositioning two black porters on a, male porters on a, on a train, um, and that was covered up, um, um, but he was, he was exited out. Had he stayed, he was Under Secretary of State, had he stayed, perhaps Breckenridge Long, um, who was very, very ambitious, would not have had the same sway and the same power. So you're absolutely right. Individuals made a huge difference. I don't, it seems like the problems in state have persisted over time. Um, I'm not quite sure I know exactly why, um, because perhaps you have this combination of political appointees and lifetime, um, lifetime diplomatic corps appointees who, who grow staid and stasis in, in, their, in their positions. But they were very different, at least in my grandfather's time, they were very different.